Hey, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Appreciate your listening and hope you learned something this week here on the podcast. Brought to you in part by Cabela's. They're our official outfitters. The more and more I talk about it, the more um, positive response I get to my favorite bird and pursuing it. Chucker Alectoris is the Latin name. You know it as the Chucker Partridge, Red Lake Partridge, something like that. Whatever you call it, it seems like every time I talk about it, write about it, or uh, get in a conversation with somebody else, it is intriguing to them as much as it is to me. So we're going to explore that a little bit. I'm going to share from a very personal standpoint some of my observations so that you can uh, decide for yourself whether a trip to the West and uh, to the most desolate part of the United States is worth it for you. We'll also have a few other things, including a dog training tip. Uh, We'll address your second highest rated priority for this season in the dog training world. And then I'll put a capper on it by making a few suggestions about places to go should you want to come or should you live in the West already and you want to pursue the devil birds. That's what we call them. And the reason will become evident very soon. You know, if you just watch Wing Shooting USA, the TV show, um, you might think all I get to do is hunt it. Uh, get to do. What a funny way to describe it. All I do is hunt at cushy Orvis endorsed lodges and chase pen raised birds but you know when i'm not doing that i'm hunting for fun and i'm hunting in chucker country most of the time i live close enough to it i love the area for a whole bunch of reasons so in spite of the 25 other states i've hunted in i spend most of my free hunting time in southeast oregon and some of the neighboring states right there. So there's Nevada and there's Idaho and even Washington sometimes. It's all for fun and believe me, it can be. But you better be in shape. Anyway, uh, it is my favorite bird and hopefully by the end of this discussion, it will be one of your favorite birds as well. All right, before we get into the meat of the matter, let me remind you that the Upland Nation podcast is brought to you in part by Sage and Breaker Mercantile. They make the highest quality gun care products. In fact, they say they are crafted at the highest caliber. Always free shipping, sageandbreaker.com. And speaking of dog training, uh, Dogdra's TNB Dual collar system is my collar system of choice one handheld two sets of buttons to control two separate collars learn more about the dogtra tnb dual at dogtra.com all right the adage is you hunt them the first time for fun after that it's for revenge I know it's a cliche, but it's true. When you're chasing chuckers, the first thing they're going to want to do is run uphill. They don't fly until they have to, and that's when they top out at the the edge of the ridge or the, the lump that you've been running up. Then they'll fly down the hill. Eventually, you'll chase another bunch up the hill. You never catch them. Even those stubby little legs that they have can move them faster than you or your dog can move. And they'll fly down again. Rinse, repeat, ad infinitum. The challenge becomes they're not only running up the hills, but those are some of the steepest, rockiest, most dangerous hills you'll ever encounter. Most of them born of volcanic activity and peopled, if you will, populated by all sorts of things that will sting, bite, scratch, poison, or eat you. It makes for real adventure. And that's probably part of the allure of chucker hunting. That and the fact that you're probably going to top out on some of the hills that most people will never see. And once you get up there, you might see two, three other states in the distance. It's pretty incredible. 
you get a history lesson every time you go, whether it's um, uh, from our Native American predecessors who were hunting there before, or some of the settlers, uh, Basque sheep herders, ranchers of one sort or another, some of the original beef barons settled that country and developed it such as it is. So it, it's just, uh, you know, one of those places where you got to go at least once. Maybe it's a bucket list kind of bird for that reason. Now, what I do want to remind you of is the, the chuckers that you're finding at the game club, game bird clubs and the hunting lodges are a little bit different. Sure. It's the same biological bird, same DNA, but, but the birds that are raised in the wild have been fending off cougars, coyotes, bobcats, and eagles on a regular basis. So they're a lot more wary and nervous as a cat in a room full of rocking chairs. If you get a shot, consider yourself lucky. You'll probably be panting and wheezing, and those birds will be moving and scattering in various directions. I've had them fly up between my legs. Yeah, it's not just a joke. It's the truth. It happens. And once they fly, not only will they be flying in a downward direction most of the time, so your shooting is always ass backwards, you know, leading down instead of up or left instead of right. Um, it will probably be impaired by some sort of a sagebrush or a pile of rocks or a ridge line or something else. That's their number one goal is to put something between you and them. They've learned that the hard way for any number of reasons. And I'll explain some of those as we go on through this discussion but mainly because they live in those desolate places of the West's Great Basin. Now, if you Google Great Basin and then find a map, it's basically the, the inland west between the Sierra Nevada mountains, the Cascade Mountains on the left side, the west, and the Rocky Mountains on the east. That's a pretty apt description of, of a sump all the water that drains into that area from rivers like the Truckee and the Owyhee and others like that pretty much goes there to die. There are no outlets. There are a few lakes that uh, without those rivers would probably dry up and blow away, but mainly it's desert with hills. In fact, in Nevada, they call it basin and range country. One big basin and a whole bunch of little ranges in there where sagebrush, juniper trees, and rocks are the principal crops. You'll run into cattle. You'll run into hay to feed the cattle. You'll find some sheep still these days, even a vestige of the Basque culture in many of those areas. But it is ugly country, a vertical hell that grows crags, rocky knobs, and scrubby bowls where prospectors died and Mother Nature is still the boss. The towns are small if you can find them at all, and the sky is the darkest it will ever be in the lower 48 because there's so few people there. In fact, according to the New York Times of all places, it's the farthest you can get in the lower 48 from a Starbucks in a hospital. So bring your survival kit. The chuckers love it. So do some of us who hunt them and the dogs. Well, they go along for the ride, probably thinking we're crazy. So why do I do it? Why do so many others do it? Uh, whether uh, they're in Nevada, Utah, Eastern Washington, Idaho, well, number one, at least for me, is we're walking in the footsteps of our Native American predecessors, the guys who uh, were there before chuckers were actually introduced to the area. They were hunting something else and chronicling that on some of the rocks with their scratchings of bighorns and deer and spacemen and that sort of thing. 
Lots of pioneers tried to make a go of it out there, homesteaders. It was big homesteading country. In fact, I'll sit on some of those hills and look down, and you can still see where some of the old fence lines were and how they grazed it. Well, you, you know, you decide whether that was the right way or not, but you can see those old fence lines down there, even though the fence crumbled long ago. And even to this day, some of my friends who are still buckarooing for a living are out there making it work, pushing those beef from spring to fall and everywhere in between. Kind of a history lesson in a nutshell out there in Chucker country. Still find the occasional teepee ring. I do know of one Mexican bandits hideout cave. Found a few gold mines, a whole bunch of petroglyphs. I was climbing hand over hand one time and as I got to the top on the left in a big cleft of rock was a golden eagle's nest. Found an old orchard out there, apple orchard. There isn't a weekend I'm out there where I don't find at least obsidian chips and sometimes whole arrowheads. These round marbles that ended up being what they call volcano bombs. They're kind of a quartzy looking thing. They're round as a marble and about the same size. Cougar kills all the time, rattlesnakes every time. And uh, so uh, if you haven't vaccinated your dog or you haven't um, um, sent him to the uh, snake avoidance clinic, maybe it's a good idea that you do that at some point. Other than all those things, you want to save your energy for the chuckers. You know, a lot of people uh, think chuckers came simply from Eastern Europe, but they came from a lot of the areas in the Middle East as well. Uh, some of the uh, sandy, rocky areas of Syria, Pakistan. In fact, still have Facebook friends who are chucker hunters out in Pakistan. The foothills of the Himalayas. So they have a great wide native home range and so in the 30s when they were first introduced to Nevada they glommed on to the ugliest country they were introduced in a whole bunch of states I think 30 or 40 all told uh, you know in everything from you know grain crops to grass meadows to uh, this ugly stuff in the Great Basin where they flourished a lot like their home territory which is really the Wild West. There's all sorts of fascinating things up there from the Basque sheep herders carvings on the aspen trees to their stone boys, which are basically just rock piles, cairns that they built because they had nothing better to do up there watching the sheep. One of the places I go and one of the folks I've hung with out there is great-grandparents were the last fatalities in the Bannock Indian War. Still uh, full of legend and Western heritage out there in Chucker country. But let's talk a little bit more about the birds, and we will do that coming up right after a quick break. So hang on. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Tim's performance dog food. First thing you should know is you get 30% off your first order. Just use the code Upland Nation. D-R-T-I-M-S dot com is where you uh, peruse the variety of formulas out there. All of them with maximum protein content based from animal products that's where the best protein comes and still love the fact that when you buy a bag it's a 40 pound bag and there's good value there doesn't happen near as often as you think and if you are perturbed at wherever or whomever you're buying your dog food from because the price stays the same as the bags get smaller go to d-r-t-i-m-s dot com Get 30% off your first order with the code Upland Nation. And yes, even in chucker country these days, because listening is one of the more important skills you will use, 
I am using my ESP hearing protection devices. Electronic shooters protection on the range and in the field. Learn more about them at ESPAmerica.com. You can hear everything, whether it's the trap throwers launching your next broken target or the chuckers calling to you from the top of the hill. All right, welcome back. I'm Scott Linden. This is the Upland Nation podcast, talking chuckers and chucker hunting and uh, related issues. Uh, one of them that um, came to me, thought might make a good handle it segment, and here we are in that particular feature right now. You know, I told you about that newsletter poll that I take, and uh, uh, in a recent newsletter, I asked what your training goals are for between now and the beginning of the season. Uh, the number two item on that list was recall, you know, getting your dog to come back while you're in the field. I understand that, you know, there really only are three things you need to, to expect from your dog to go away from you when you want to stand still when you want and ideally to come back when you want. That's easy in the yard or when there's less distraction than there is on a hunt. But it's probably hardest when a dog actually has a bird in his mouth and is savoring the fact that he got a reward for doing his job. Well, let's hope that's what it was for. <laughs> anyway, so getting your dog back while he's retrieving. Think about it for a moment. I'm just going to leave you with this. What do you do the moment your dog brings a bird back to you? All proud and happy and savoring the ultimate reward for his hard work. You snatch it away. Now, is that a good way to say thank you for your hard work? Give me that. How about instead letting him savor it for a while? Now, most birds, most bird dogs, most of the time, yes, they want that bird in their mouth. But they're probably not going to take it apart. They're probably not going to swallow it. They're probably not going to run away with it. If you show him, you don't want it immediately. Now you might have to clip a lead to him, step on a check cord in a training situation. But the whole idea being help your dog learn that the moment he brings a dead bird back to you is not the moment you take his reward away. Hey, it's working with Flick. I want to thank trainer Brad Higgins for really driving this point home to me. Learn more about him at Higgins Gun Dogs. Thank you, Brad. And also thank you all for listening to the Upland Nation podcast. Our topic today, chuckers, what they are, who they are, what they act like, and now how to find them. Yeah, well... It's easy and it's hard. Like I've said, head for the Great Basin. And, and I'll, I'll expand that definition just a little bit here. You know, you can find them in the Mojave Preserve in Southeast California, along the White Mountains in Northeast California, and all those other uh, kind of s branches, if you will, of the Sierras and the Cascades, wherever it's dry, scrubby, desert-like, and... Uh, there's evidence of volcanoes, uh, including all the way up into the Snake River and the Columbia River breaks in eastern Washington. Idaho's got them. Well, I can go on and on, but I'll talk more about that as we get to the end of this podcast. But in the meanwhile, if you're in Chucker country, the first thing you can do is get lucky and stand still and shut up. You might just hear them calling to each other. They're very vocal. Not that they'll always talk with each other, but many times they will. And, and, you know, one of the few birds that's name reflects their sound. It is chuck, chuck, chuck. And they'll do that as they gather, but they'll also do it just for fun, I think. So you want to look for slopes with rim rocks, you know, little cliffs where there's exposed rock. They'll hang out there a lot, not just at night where they'll get some of the uh, lingering heat off of those rocks, but also for shelter 
and for the fact that it is close enough to some of their principal feeds. Now, most people will tell you that chuckers live on cheat grass. If you can't find cheat grass, you can't find chuckers. To a great degree, that's probably true in many places. And if you don't know what cheat grass is, look it up. It's a weed, but it's flourishing in the West. And the seeds and the shoots, depending on the time of year, will nourish a chucker crop. The more cheat grass, probably the more chuckers. But they'll eat just about anything, especially as the pickings get slim. I found them with sagebrush leaves, all sorts of other little forby kind of leaves in there. They'll eat bugs, of course, and anything else that might be available. If they're close enough to a crop of some sort, they'll eat those seeds or grains and even a few alfalfa leaves once in a while. So keep an open mind. Look for them from below most of the time. If, especially if you haven't been to the gym for a while. On cold mornings, they'll move to the south-facing slopes. On wintry days, they'll usually come down below snow line to feed. They can scratch through snow as long as it's not crusted over, and they will do that to a great degree, looking for sagebrush or for cheatgrass shoots. They eat a lot of that, you know, the green up that comes starting in the fall. Sometimes you get really lucky and see them skyline on a ridge, but by then they'll probably have seen you too. So what kind of strategy to use? Well, if you can get up to the top and work down or work sideways, all the better. Remember when I first started talking about these devil birds, I was talking about how they'll run uphill and then fly downhill. Well, if you're uphill from them, you've cut off their major escape strategy. So try and get to the top or close to the top and then work your way across looking for birds, letting your dog do the hard work of going down and back, down and back, into the wind, of course, if you can at all. And with luck, uh, those birds will be pegged somewhere below you. Now, that doesn't help your shooting, or especially my shooting, because um, I'm a bad enough shot on a going-away bird, let alone a going-away and going-down bird. So if you can, somewhere at the range, practice some of those downward shots. Dog will also appreciate starting at the top, because once the valley floors start to warm up, the wind will be coming from below up toward your dog. If you can teach him to stop and whoa if you will on visible running birds all the better because chucker coveys will often be caught out in the open and they'll keep running and your dog will run run want to run after them if possible and there goes your shots because they won't fly until they're way out of range so get to the top be stealthy about it if you do see a bird, it's probably the sentinel bird, and he's probably on a rock, and he's looking for people like you who want to shoot him. So do your best to put a sneak on those birds in one way or another. Put stuff between you and them. Come at them from above. Cut off their main escape strategy. And then send the dog in. Hopefully, you'll get a whiff of scent, and everybody will stop, and you'll get in on that first flush. Now, if there's no cheat grass, you might think twice about whether it's worthwhile to climb to the top of the hill. But if there is any semblance of cheat grass nearby, remember they're not going to be in it all the time. They're going to be near it. Then it's worth the climb. You know, funny story. I was I was hunting a spot that had basically been burned the year before by uh, by wildfires, of course, and. Uh, the only green uh, greenery was the you know the ten yards on either side of the creek I was walking along. Ended up shooting three chuckers out of that green stuff. Uh, opened the crops on all three of them. Well, what did I find inside? Toasted cheatgrass seeds. Hmm. Maybe that's their version of popcorn. <laughs> All right, so uh, final uh, final bit on cheatgrass itself. Uh, by other names, there are similar seeds all over the country, foxtail, speargrass, whatever it is, they have what's called an on, A 
W N, which means that they'll get caught in everything on your dog and work their way in deeper. And I mean, disgustingly deeper. I've had stories of training partners whose dogs have gotten uh, cheatgrass seeds in between their tooth and their gum and it's worked its way out through their chin yeah they're that kind of thing kind of like a porcupine quill so check your dogs carefully their eyes their eyelids between their toes down their ears up their nose into their throats they'll drill into skin and migrate to vital organs they can kill a dog they can create a what's called a foreign body pneumonia if they inhale one so be very careful and check your dog at least a couple times a day. Now, how do they act? Well, I'll never forget. Um, I alluded to the, I t- talked about uh, the, gu- the guy, he's no longer with us, whose grandparents were the last fatality in the Bannock Indian War. Well, one night, I can't even b- believe I remembered this one, but one night he said, yep, you know that spot? And I said, yeah, I do. I know it well. He says, go there at one o'clock. That's when the chuckers will show up for water. I said, oh, come on. But I did, and they did, and uh, it was a wonderful day. Never since then has it happened again. They will go to water, but I don't think they they can read a clock, and I don't think they really care that much about that there are so many other variables involved in when a bird needs water just know that the birds do need water and if you are hunting an area with water i would check in every once in a while and i would also check a lot in between all the good loafing and roosting habitat and that water which might be just a little spring it might be a creek it might be a cattle tank it might be just a depression in rocks after a hard rainstorm And that's the thing that will happen quite often. Once it starts raining in the fall, all bets are off in terms of those blue lines on the map. So uh, be creative about where you're going to find water and look for it while you're hunting and make a note of it. What kind of dog do you need? Well, the dog you are with is the one that I would consider to be the best chucker, jaw, chucker dog of the moment. I like big running dogs that will point if they'll hold a point. But there are Labrador owners out there who swear by their breed, and there are Cocker Spaniel and Springer Spaniel guys who will do the same thing. They'll work a little closer, so if the birds do get up, you'll have a crack at them. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I like the fact that we can cover a lot of territory with a 100-yard and a 200-yard dog, maybe even a 300-yard dog. And when there's something to be found, he'll make sure you know about it, whether the bell stops ringing or the beeper starts beeping. Then you climb up the hill and hopefully get a shot. One thing I would suggest, no matter what kind of dog you're hunting with, you want to carry as much water as possible. There are times when I've regretted that and found that I had to abort what was turning into a pretty good hunt simply because I ran out of water. You could be a thousand feet above your truck and if you're not carrying enough, well, the hunt's over. It's a very real possibility that your dog or yourself can become dehydrated and suffer heat exhaustion or worse. So carry a lot of one and by a lot of water i mean like a couple hundred ounce a couple hundred uh yeah ounces yeah yeah half gallon or more all right so the joy of chucker hunting is they're usually in bunches and out of the bunch there's usually one slow learner who doesn't fly when everybody else does so If you miss that covey flush, one of the smartest things you can do is hold your second barrel or your first shot, depending on their timing, for the stragglers who will fly up in dribs and drabs. One, two, maybe even three or four of them will wait it out. Hopefully, you'll remember that the next time the birds fly and you'll get a shot at one of those 
slightly easier to focus on birds that didn't get up early. That's a good reason to have a steady dog as well. If he's still standing after the cubby flush, he won't scatter those late risers before you reload if you need to or catch your breath or let the adrenaline just settle a little bit. Now I've talked about the home territory for chuckers, inclines and ledges, but within that milieu, that environment of knobs and hills and cliffs and rocks, there are always flat spots and bowls, which I will explore in great detail because whether it's the wind, uh, the shade from some of the taller sagebrush, or protection from predators, those bowls and benches, the flat spots in amongst all the high spots are well worth taking a look at, especially on those windy days. You got a partner? You know, misery does love company. If you have a friend who's hunting with you, one of the things I might suggest is that one of you go a little bit up the slope, 100, 200 yards, and then you both run parallel to each other along the slope. Sometimes you'll push birds up to him. They'll be scared enough when they see him to fly back down to you. Sometimes he'll push birds down to you, and you'll get the shots. It works, especially if you have two good dogs. And it's certainly worth the trouble as long as you divide the labor fairly and one person takes the uphill part half the day and the other person gets it the other half of the day. Now, whether he or they shoot as well as me or not is not a question. Everybody shoots better than me. So choke your double gun, improved cylinder and modified. The shots will be at 30, 40 yards and you do want to drop them stone dead because if you do not, they'll set their wings and they'll glide hundreds of yards down a hill that you're going to have to send a dog down to or you're going to have to go down to to get that bird. I like number six shot, maybe even five shot later in the season for the same reason. You want those birds dead. Once on the breaks of a eastern Oregon river, I had that happen to me after a pretty good day and I'll be darned if I was going to let that bird get away so we walked all the way down that hill draw really uh, searching the whole time I had my old dog buddy back at the, at the time and he was doing his best to find that bird and I was doing my best to find that bird and after uh, it got pretty much dark I'd given up turned around and headed for the truck Till I heard the jingle of collar tags and there he was holding that bird in his mouth. It had probably traveled a good quarter mile down that draw by the time it died. Luckily, I trust the hunter with the longest nose and he delivered for me. Thanks, buddy. Finally, maybe the most important lesson, I've saved it for last on purpose, a successful chucker hunter's adage is never give up altitude. Once you've found a few birds, most likely most of the time, all the coveys will be on about the same elevation. So side hill along the ridges at that elevation or get back to it if you can. The odds are just in your favor that way. If you are chasing birds down a hill because they flew that way, remember most of them are going to be back at that level. So be, uh, be um, careful about how much altitude you're going to give up. Good luck to you. i got a few more things to talk about, including places to go, right after this quick break. Brought to you by Huron, South Dakota, where the pheasants outnumber people. Learn more about Huron's 124,000 acres of public access at hunthuronsd.com and welcome our newest sponsor Happy Jack they have dog care remedies for skin coat parasites fleas and ticks paws and everything else attached to your dog 
Learn more about all their great stuff at happyjackinc.com. That's happyjackinc.com. And espamerica.com, where you learn all about the digital solutions to hearing loss, preventing hearing loss. Let's just call it that. You're not deaf yet, are you? Or are you? Well, learn more at espamerica.com. All right. So easier said than done. And if you talk to enough Chuck and Hunters, you're going to realize that most of them are, are, are not going to tell you exactly where to go. No latitude, no longitude. And I'm in the same boat, although on a personal basis, one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one, -on -one, I will probably tell you what draws in what mountain ranges, in what states to go to, because I want you to succeed as much as you want to succeed, brother to brother. For a starting point, I talked about that basin and range country of northern Nevada. Up near Winnemucca is a good place. Out to Battle Mountain. Even Elko, that country out there. Eastern Oregon, eastern Washington. On the east side of the Cascades, almost to the Idaho border in most cases. Northeast California, good jumping off points include Alturas and Susanville, two towns up there much of western and southwestern Idaho on the west side of the state, if you will, along the Snake River, that area. Utah and Wyoming also have chuckers. Well, so does Hawaii, but most people aren't going to go there for them. Most wise chucker hunters will change the subject when you ask where to go, so eventually you're going to have to do your own uh, homework. You're going to have to learn by trial and error and you're going to have to invest some boot leather. Now, Nevada's Wildlife Department probably does the best job of counting chuckers, although their data is now a little bit more loosey-goosey because they quit using helicopters after a fatal crash a couple of years ago. But if you want to learn more from them, they, they're also great guys and very helpful. N-D-O-W dot org, the Nevada Department of Wildlife dot org. Learn more about chuckers there. And on the internet, the only suggestion I have is most of the internet stuff is going to, uh, you're going to require more than a grain or two of salt there. So um, learn for yourself. You earn every bird. Chucker hunting is a passion. It's not for everybody, but it is certainly something to consider when you combine the history, the culture, the challenge, the physical aspects of it, and the chance to be in places where most people will never be. Hey, you know what my truck looks like if you watch the TV show. If you see it out there, leave me a note. Tell me where you're going to be. We'll have a beer at the end of the day. Until then, I want to thank you for listening. I hope you'll tell your friends all about the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. You want to talk in between now and the next podcast? Go to the Wing Shooting USA or the Upland Nation Facebook pages. I sure would appreciate a positive review at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or iHeartRadio. Thanks for the reviews from B Mystic, Valley Quail, and Upland Britman. Five stars make my day. Appreciate that so much. It's time to start looking toward the first hunt of the year. Make sure you have your field first aid kit, not just for you, but for your dog as well. Check out the list for that first aid kit at finebirdhuntingspots.com. See you in the field. Thanks again for listening.